Lewis Sullivan uh, is an architect who was most well known for the term, oh, sorry, he was the father of modern skyscrapers, but he's most well known for the term or the phrase form follows function. The idea that a building and how it looks really should be defined by how it's used and the intent of how it's used. And so it follows that maps should also be designed and look how they should be used as well. And so today I want to talk to you about how, how and perhaps why as well you should put on your designer's hat um, while you're crafting your map experiences. Uh, so I'm Andrea. I run a data visualization company in Sydney. Uh, and we've been doing this a while now for about eight years. Amongst other things, we make a lot of maps, heaps and heaps and heaps of maps. Um, but we're fairly multidisciplinary. Um, I myself have been coding and designing data visualizations for about 15 years now. And so I wanted to use kind of the experiences that we've had doing all of these kind of little projects um, and kind of build uh, a pattern that I can, I can talk to you about. So there are two main principles uh, when it comes to design. So a lot of people think about design as just a thing that you stick on at the end that's like a visual lipstick. That's definitely not what I want to talk about in terms of design. Design is something that, like the term suggests, form follows function, that really helps your audience and your customers and your users make the most out of what you've made for them. Actually get use out of it, because at the end of the day, we're not making things just to sit there. We're not making art, certainly, even though a lot of the things that we produce are beautiful. We really want them to be used and obvious and intuitive. So that's form and function. It's also about visual communication. So these two lend uh, to each other. The idea that things should look the way that they underneath um, function. Uh, and I'll talk to you through a case study. Uh, that's kind of a mock-up project that I made for this talk. Going to point it through the idea of a design workflow. So these are steps that you might already be using in how you make maps day to day um, and how you can insert little bits of design. Because I know that everyone is time poor or you may be the one person on the team uh, or there's no budget for a design portion. So maybe if you can choose one of these steps, slowly, slowly build um, each of these steps up and maybe you can have design as part of your workflow. And if you already do, that's great. Um, hopefully I can give you some interesting um, perspectives um, from a kind of designer slash developer point of view. So this is what the story or the idea of the mock-up project was. I initially wanted to see where New Zealanders were in Australia and vice versa as well. I'll tell you the story of that in a little bit. Um, so, where do New Zealanders live in Australia? What are the main kind of population areas, um, the top areas? I thought it would be actually a good idea to put it in Australia and not vice versa because I don't know much about New Zealand geography, so that would have been a little bit of a push. But for me, I have an understanding at least of Australian geography, so I can make some kind of hopefully smart assumptions about what you might know um, and then double check that with what I know. And hopefully the data set itself is interesting to you as well, and I talk a little bit about the audience in a moment. So the first step in this design flow, workflow is going to look very similar to what you have already. Things like looking up data and having data handed over to you or having um, needing to have an idea and do some research. So I already knew that the Australian Bureau of Statistics, we run a census in Australia at five years, yours is about the same. Um, and there's one question, which is the country of birth of person. So I chose that um, so that we could have all of the New Zealanders. So that's what I define as New Zealanders in this project, at least. I knew about the geography that the ABS had also given. Uh, so there are other... Um, Lots of different levels. So these are the non-statistically um, linked ones. These are things just like arbitrary suburbs and local council areas and so forth. So I chose local council areas or LGAs at the bottom because that was quite a large chunk. There are something like, oh, I've already forgotten. There are 150 in New South Wales. So there's maybe about 500 across all of Australia. That number is probably wrong, by the way. 
Um, and also the ABS have this lovely thing called Table Builder, which lets you get a lot of information from the census and you can cross-tabulate and everything. So I essentially went for all of the people who said that they were from or they were born in New Zealand, um, which LGAs do they live in, but also which LGAs do they work in. So I got two uh, different sets of data. I also compared that or I also got the numbers for the whole population of those LGAs as well. So that was because I knew a little bit already about what I was looking for. It's really helpful coming to a conference like this to know where the information is because sometimes a Google search just doesn't work. Um, so sometimes you just have to know that you go, have to go to ABS to find this. And got into QGIS as everyone does um, and had a look and I got this. So this is mapping uh, where people live, I think, yes, where people live in Australia. This is not helpful at all, because most people live in the metro areas, and the metro areas are really, really tiny compared to the big regional ones. It's kind of interesting that there's this um, mass in um, Western Australia, in the Pilbara, um, but other than that, this kind of wasn't super helpful, but at least it's the start of the analysis. I gave up on the map a little bit, only because it wasn't helping me find any stories or any trends, and I went to this tool called Data Wrapper, which, is free, uh, which has a free tier. They also do some maps. They're actually a data journalism based tool. So for journalists to um, show charts and graphics and also lots of maps as well. So it's very much about storytelling, very much about annotations as well. Um, so I made some charts uh, just looking at people's places of work versus where they actually live and also percentages um, of the population because that seemed to be a thing. Then just did some basic mapping of, um, and these are all kind of just for the purposes of an analysis, so I haven't put in titles or legends or anything like that. It was just a part of the process. Um, so one of them shows place of residence, and the other one shows um, place of work, which is the pink one on the left. Then I went back into QGIS and started playing with other things. I also started playing with style a little bit. So I wanted the idea that the population centers would light up um, rather than have the other, the other positive or negative space, so did something slightly different. Um, and I also found between this is where people live and this is where people work. Um, so being able to just on the side of QGIS and tick on and off things just to see the comparison, that was really useful as well. So, and th so that was Australia and I figured out all of that. I started looking at um, New Zealand and like other people have mentioned, I have a small child that you might have seen running around. Um, they say this is a child friendly conference. I haven't seen any other children. I think it's just an Orion friendly conference, which is lovely. Thank you organizers. Um, so I didn't have much time. And one of the things that I was worried about with this is that I kept on trying to look for similar statistics in New Zealand about Australians living in New Zealand. I couldn't find anything. So if someone, after this talk and come and talk to me because I want to have a, like a, a two-way, a vice versa kind of um, story. So I looked and I couldn't really find it. Um, so unfortunately, that side of the story is missing at the moment. So in terms of this analysis, I'm probably telling you a lot of things that you already know, but I hope that you take away that really these things that you use during this process are tools for analysis. They're not the tools for communication, the ones that you will use eventually. I hope that they help you find the insights and patterns and trends, and maybe that it helps you be open to different ideas as well. So the second step is crafting. Um, so I don't know if he's as popular, is he as popular in New Zealand as he is in Australia? Um, maybe not. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, so I did some research and the crafting side is maybe a side that is missing from your workflow, possibly. Um, the idea of audience and story. And so things like the Pilbara region of um, Western Australia, that regional area that kind of lit up, I had no idea what that meant. We have a New Zealander in the office, but she's been in Australia for so long that she's lost her accent a little bit, people say. Um, and so she didn't know either. So I started doing some research. This was just for fun. Um, but I did actually do some serious research about the immigration history of New Zealanders to Australia, the fact that there's a mine, a big New Zealand mine in the Pilbara, um, and things about you know the legalities of moving to Australia when you're in New Zealand. Zealander. So all of this helped me craft the story, or at least helped me get some background about an understanding of what was happening in the data. The data was interesting in some ways, but it's kind of just facts. It's not really supported by anything. So I wanted to get into the story a little bit. Um, so when I looked at, oh, and the other thing is that we need to make sure that 
when I'm presenting to you that you see the things that are familiar to you. So this is kind of small, um, but all of these names are from an ABS data set that is uh, looking at big urban localities. So I hoped that that would be a good default for what some of the cities that you might know as well, um, because otherwise you would just see a map of all of these LGAs, which are unfamiliar to me as well as unfamiliar to you. So in this section, I want to make sure that the story that you're crafting and the audience is reflected in terms of familiarity. So hopefully, I know that you don't know as much about Australian geography as me, so I'm going to try and help you with that. Um, let's pretend in this mock-up project that it should be shareable afterwards. I hope to get a version of this up at some point, um, that maybe you see it and you share it with your um, friends and family that may be looking at migrating to Australia, for example. Goodness knows why you would be doing that, though. Um, please take me. Um, and also um, shareability, the idea that, yeah, you would be sharing. So how it, could it... Uh, adhere to all of these forms. No, so it's not just about this one thing that you're going to make, it's about the instances of how people are going to consume it and under what kind of context are they going to be using it. At the end of the day, it's just about thinking of who you're making it for and hoping that you're making it in a way that's contextual for them and that's as useful as possible. The other thing that you can do at this point is maybe test your idea with a couple of people. So I tested it internally with our team. Um, I asked Jack, who's also giving a talk tomorrow as well, um, just to kind of sense check everything. It's always good to get a second opinion. Sketching, another part that actually you might already have in part of your workflow. So there's only one slide about sketching, I think, yes. So the only thing with sketching is that it, there's no constraints. You're not pushing pixels around you don't have the technical constraints of whatever you're working on. You've done all this research, this analysis, this crafting, and then you have your idea that's in your head. And so you want to make it concrete and put it onto paper, which is the most open thing that you can have. So I really encourage you, if you're not already doing it, is just sketching out that story for your particular audience using the data that you have in your head. It doesn't have to be realistic. I, I hardly have anything on here just to, like, bad version of Australia on the map and some lists and things like that, but I've kind of tried to explain it to myself. Um, and in doing that, I hopefully I can explain it to the audience as well. And then build. So this one's probably the thinnest because you already know how to build amazing things. Um, the only thing is that you've done all this hard work in the first three steps to craft something that's really custom. And we've heard in a previous session about um, fit for purpose and custom and bespoke and other things. And that hopefully that instead of us all making things that are obviously from one product or a few products, that we're really pushing the tools that we're using once we've done all that sketching and analysis and crafting um, to do what we want, to go out and find the right plugins and to find the right ways and the right mediums and so forth. Um, so really, really push your tool. Um, also make sure when you're doing this that things that you haven't captured in your sketching process, like edge cases, are found, um, that you've done lots and lots of iterations, change the tool if you need to change the tool, um, and like I said, find the right medium. Then um, communication. So this is kind of a wireframe version of what I had in mind. I've got a few notes on it as well. And you'll notice that this one is, again, it's kind of like a second iteration of the sketch, kind of to put ideas um, more concretely. But it focuses on a few things. So one uh, is visual hierarchy. So for those who do web as well, um, things like heading one, heading two, paragraphs, body text, really having that hierarchy of the page because that hierarchy tells your audience or your consumer or your customer what they should look at first and what is the highest priority for them. You have to make some guesses, but hopefully because of the research that you've done in the audience part and, and thinking about the user, that you know what they're looking for. You also obviously want to tell a particular story from the data that you've got as well. Um, so you can also have that narrative um, coming down through your hierarchy. Another thing that you want to show people through and, and communicate um, to people is the flow. So what they should look at, not just first, but what they should look at second and third. And um, crafting, again, that story and that narrative. And I think there's one more. Oh. Oh, and the other thing is making sure that when you're communicating something that you're choosing the right, not medium necessarily, but the right 
in this case, visualization. So these two are slightly different things or showing slightly different things, but a table is sometimes really, really useful. So I can imagine um, if this project was hopefully finished at some point and you shared it with people, that there would be a giant list of um, maybe suburbs later, um, but in this case, the council areas, and people could maybe search for one so that they could actually get in really fine-grained. And it's really, really easy and that they get the numbers as well. So a table, even though it's just a boring table, can be super, super functional for people, and so you might want that. We just tend to be, because we're in geospatial, defaulting to maps, but maybe challenge that sometimes, or maybe support your maps with other mediums as well. And finally, um, think about the, obviously there are lots of things to do with visualization and mapping, and you can use color and a whole bunch of other things, obviously, that I won't get into, the visual variables. Um, make sure that you show your hierarchy and your priority through all of those visual um, variables as well. One thing um, that I really tried to get away from, for example, um, is those very blocky LGA colors which were a problem because, like I said, there are these regional areas that don't have many people because LGAs aren't based on statistics, so they're not based on numbers of people. It's not consistent. Um, so I thought dots and colouring the centroids would be a bit better. At least you can kind of see the metro areas lit up, whereas with the previous map where it was just polygon areas, it, you couldn't see anything at all. So I definitely wanted to choose something where people you know, could actually see what the data was showing. Um, this is also, it's not too obvious, ideally here you would have some kind of maybe slider between the left and the right, like one of the demos that's outside at the moment, where you can actually see on one side is um, place of residence and the other side is where people work. And to explain some of the kind of the design decisions that were made um, with the background of this is, so there's a very clear heading, um, there's a little bit of a paragraph on what the story is, so the idea that it's the capital cities, obviously, when you're talking about absolute numbers. But funnily, of course, we would know that this is really just a population map of Australia, so it's not useful at all. Um, so the next uh, stories would probably be, let's do it by as a proportion of population instead of as absolute numbers. But for a regular viewer, maybe your friends and family, they might want to see the absolute ones. So they would go, yeah, yeah, so the top six are in Queensland, like all within um, like kilometres of each other, which is amazing. Then a few in Sydney, but overwhelmingly um, Queensland is very, very popular. And you might want to kind of um, go into that a little bit. So ideally in terms of understanding the user, I would want to talk to someone from New Zealand who knew a little bit more intimately about um, migration and they could maybe tell the story of why Brisbane and Gold Coast in particular are really, really popular. Well, maybe someone can give their two cents at the end of this talk. Um, I also chose the colour Viridis, um, which is from MATLAB originally, um, but QGIS have it as a default, as most of you probably know. Um, I actually was not familiar with this colour palette before, I'm so sorry, um, but I did some research and there's this amazing um, clip about the creators um, behind Viridis. And actually, in this case, it works really well because it really pops um, the yellow from the big, um, the big, population centres, um, and really, really kind of clearly shows the range, um, which I really liked. So colour is important too, obviously. And so in this section, it's all about making it a pleasure to you so that people actually want to engage and end up actually using what you've made, which I'm sure there are already, but then you can get them to use it more or get them other people to use it. Make sure people, things are in the right place and hierarchy and so forth. Um, make sure that your visualization is accurate, but also efficient and, and makes sense to people. And as you keep going and doing more of these, making sure that there's consistency and dare I say branding um, in all of these so that when people see something that you've done or your company or team has done, they know that it's always from you. And finally, this is outside of the scope of a project, it's just about learning. So as a designer, so when I wrote my um, immigration card into New Zealand. I can't put data visualization specialist, it's a little bit too long, so I just put designer. Um, and as a designer, I find a whole range of things quite inspirational. The New York Times, who does a lot of data journalism, do amazing maps. They also have very, very high consistency. They constantly challenge the reader and the sophistication of their audience. Um, like this one of Clinton and um, Trump's America, where they literally just f pieces of America fall away. 
Um, there's another practitioner called Marit Stefana, um, who also does really amazing work as well. Um, and some places to look for inspiration are the Information is Beautiful Awards Showcase. If you search for New York Times Year in Review and put a year, they often showcase their own work during the year. The Flowing Data blog is also really good. But this is just about opening up the possibilities for you so that you start seeing things that inspire you, you start creating a visual style of your own, um, or that you kind of start to recognize familiar patterns and um, familiar things that you think that your audience would also find familiar and therefore be able to use. So in summary, this is the design workflow based on the principles of form and function and visual communication. Like I said at the beginning, use one, start off, maybe you're already ticked off a couple of them um, and start finding inspiration and just do more. Um, so a more famous um, architect is Frank Lloyd Wright, who was actually a mentee of um, Lewis Sullivan. And what he said of his mentor was that, I said, form follows function is a mere dogma until you realize that form and function are one. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Andrew? I've got one. Actually, this is for you, Greg. What do you reckon the reason why the, uh, they're in Queensland? <laughs> rugby, <laughs> rugby and C? We're going to do the double act here. So I should, <laughs> I should just take a step back and say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Kiwi first, I'm a geographer second, but I live in Brisbane. And I've actually <laughs> written a couple of papers on exactly what you're talking about. What I found interesting more was the amount of New Zealanders who, the difference between where New Zealanders work as opposed to their place of residence, and I suspect that's got a lot to do with FIFO, or fly in, fly out, or a similar amount of New Zealanders, and I, I, I'm back in New Zealand every few months or so, and I'm amazing how many people are still on the plane, spend six weeks out in the Pilbara or out in Western Australia, uh, are flying back home for a week or two weeks, and then, then fly back and do it, so I think that explains that, but I don't think we have enough time for me to truly go through the um, things, except it is an emotive debate for New Zealanders living in Australia. It's quite an emotive <coughs> debate too, but we can go on. But uh, I'm sure we have some other questions. Hi, thank you. Um, when you use different styles and symbologies, it can really change how people perceive the data. And there's always sometimes, like uh, with statistics, there can be a bit of a bias or a bit of, if you represent the same data set in different ways, people take away different conclusions. So how do you balance those uh, potential misinformations or uh, misrepresentations of your data with good, clean, beautiful designs? Um, so. If the idea is form and function are one, hopefully you never get into an instance where you misrepresent, not knowingly at least. I would hope that if you do have an instance where there are two very good candidates for how you want to represent the data, you reflect on the people that you're making it for. There could be multiple people though who might want different things and you reflect on what you're trying to say and what you think people will get out of it and choose a default accordingly. And if you need to, have a little toggle or something for the other one. That's kind of the, the cheats way of doing it, if you have different audiences. Otherwise, you have to choose one. And hopefully both of them, like I said, not misrepresentative, but they tell, just tell slightly different things, but still objective and still honest. Any other questions? Uh, great talk, by the way. Um, in your presentation, you, you, I don't know if people get this where you're trying to show uh, data as counts or as relative as percentages. I don't know if you could just give, do you have any advice? And, and really what you really want to do is have kind of a combination <laughs> sometimes. Do you have any comments on really ways to visualize counts and percentages or is it look at one map and look at another map? In some instances, it might be just two maps. Like in this one, I deliberately chose the counts as the main map that I showed you as the top of the mock-up because have child don't have time to do rest of mock-ups. Um, and that's because it seemed to me as a guess for the audience that that might be, well, no, maybe not you, but maybe the people that you might share this with might be the simplest way of understanding it. A lot of people um, in my experience doing data viz for so long still need the simplest answer. Um, even though proportion is 
the technically correct answer and people like us might understand that, but a regular person won't. So again, it's just thinking about the audience and what works best for them.